in terms in there you may not understand, but um, we'll repeat this from time to time so you begin to know what they mean. So uh, in a recent manuscript that I've put together um, called The Original Frontier, based on the idea that Buddha entered into a frontier of sorts uh, through his meditation, uh, different from a geographical frontier, but similar in the sense that it uh, represents a jumping off point, uh, a point of no return, uh, entering into uh, unfamiliar territory, <clears throat> and has a bridge you know, to familiar territory. And so um, I think it's a good metaphor for what we do in Zen meditation. We enter into the original frontier. The original frontier is accessible and present, you might say, no matter where you are in time and space. Unlike a geographical frontier, which is by definition at the boundary of settled territory, this original frontier is uh, here at all times. And so we can enter into it uh, at any time. Um, structuring the organization of the book, it occurred to me after reading through this little pamphlet that was handed out at Chicago Zen Buddhist Temple, uh, there was kind of the perfect organizational structure. It begins with an introduction, brief introduction, it's very poetic, and disposition of the body. Next is uh, disposition of breathing, and uh, finally disposition of the mind. And then a concluding kind of stanza, perfection in Zen. And so I thought it would uh, not only be a good um, uh, framework around which to hang the structure of the, the book I was writing about, this original frontier. Um, but also, uh, for the talk today, I think it would give us a um, framework around which to discuss quite a lot of different things, a lot of different aspects of Zen. So I would like to do the introduction in the oral tradition that we often do, it's very brief, where I say the line, you're not familiar with it, right? And you try to say it with me. So I say it slowly. And uh, this is the way, and the oral uh, tradition is the way that it used to be that you would learn the teaching because it, was, it wasn't written down anywhere. So you would have to go to where somebody was reciting it. And usually it would be a, a bunch of monks and nuns all reciting it together. So we think it was transmitted this way for about 400 years the Buddhist teaching, we understand Christian teachings were as well. And uh, while you think, well, that might, that's a pretty, uh, pretty risky way to try to transmit teachings, uh, we think it's really, once you begin to experience it, you can begin to see that it's really pretty, pretty dependable because if you have to chant it with somebody, you can't change it. Uh, and if the only way you can learn it, memorize it, is to memorize it by chanting it with somebody, then we think it's a more accurate uh, medium, you might say, for transmitting the teaching. Whereas once they were written down after 400 years or so, any scribe who's copying them or any, for any political reason, a person could accidentally change it or a person could change it on purpose, uh, right? The copy would be wrong. And then, like the telephone game, the next copy would be wrong. And the next, so by the, by the time it would reach uh, our generation, it would be completely out of whack. So we think the oral tradition uh, was valuable, and we lost something when we lost it, when we gained the uh, written word and later the printed word. So this very brief section, the introduction, I'd like you to try to do that with me. It starts out saying, the thought of Zen is the flower. 
So that's, that's the first line. So please say this with me. The thought of Zen is the flower. The mind is attracted by its beauty. The art of Zen is the fruit. Its savor comes home to one's heart. The practice of Zen is the life. By it, the body and mind become strong and continue to prosper for eternity. The place of the practice of Zen is Zazen. The ideal of Zazen is the seated figure of Buddha. We love the flower of Zen. We rejoice in the fruit of Zen. And we yearn for the life of Zen. So I'm not sure if that's original with Matsuoka Roshi, if he translated that from you know, a poem. And so I'm just going to read you the rest of it quickly, the disposition of the body, and you'll recognize a lot of this from the instructions we give and from Master Dogen's Fukan Zazengi, which is the universal promotion for Zazen or based the principles of seated meditation. Disposition of the body, and again, uh, Matsuoka Roshi broke this down in three very simple things, body, posture, breath, or body, breath, body, posture, breath, and attention, right? Uh, disposition of the body. Lotus form sitting, in quotes, or sitting with folded legs, is characteristic of an ideally seated figure of the Buddha. The right leg is folded and placed on the thigh of the left leg. Then the left leg is folded and placed on the thigh of the right leg. It is permissible to reverse this order. There are various kinds of seated figures of the Buddha. It is sufficient so long as one folds one legs and sits. It does not matter if one cannot place one leg over the other. It is also acceptable to sit on a chair and have the feet rest on the floor. However, the feeling of stability which one experiences when one sits with his legs folded is so wonderful that one cannot help but wish to sit in this manner. Once the disposition of the legs is completed to the best of one's ability, the hand should then be rested in front of the lower ab abdomen. The palm of the right hand should be turned upward. The palm of the left hand should also be turned upward, placed on the right palm. The thumbs of both hands, the left lying on top of the right, are then raised with the right thumb in contact with the left thumb. The thumbs which are raised, one in contact with the other, then face the palm of the hands and form a beautiful gem-like ellipse. Next is the disposition of the upper half of the body. The lower ab abdomen below the navel is forcefully pushed forward. The lower back becomes straight and strength enters into the lower abdomen. If strength should rather penetrate into the upper abdomen at this time, one should attempt this over and over again until the strength enters only into the lower abdomen. When strength has entered into the lower abdomen, one's posture will be as if he is lifting the ceiling with the vertex of his head. The neck will stretch with strength. The face will be downcast just a fraction. When strength enters into the lower abdomen and one has established a posture as described above, then his upper body will assume a straight, poised appearance. His mind will be clear and refreshed. Just a note here before we go on to the disposition of breathing. Use of the pronoun he, his, was not considered incorrect at the, at the time of this writing. Uh, so Matsuoka Roshi was following conventions. And uh, remember, again, he's teaching in a second language. Japanese was his native language. And uh, to me, that's remarkable, not only for him, but for Okamura Roshi and for many others who uh, somehow managed to think in Japanese but talk, speak in English, and write in English. Uh, so the disposition of breathing. When the disposition of the body has been established, the next step is the disposition of the breathing. Inhale the breath as much as possible through the nose. One should inhale the breath, keeping in mind the thought of having it go deep into the bottom of the lower abdomen, filling it completely. The inhaled breath should then be let out through the nose in a thin stream, beginning quietly, lightly, and slowly. Then the breath should be exhaled gradually in a thick stream, stronger, and then rapidly until it is all gone. Inhaling breath deeply through the nose is known as kuki, or drawing in breath. Exhaling breath is known as koki, or expelling breath. In disposition of the mind, 
When Zazen is being practiced satisfactorily, one's mind is always quiet, peaceful, clear, and serene. The mind then functions perfectly. The intellect is crystal clear without a cloud to dim it. The emotions and will are pure and strong. When one is practicing Zazen, there are times when one becomes sleepy, when one's mind becomes cloudy and heavy, when one is restless like a monkey jumping from tree to tree. Such conditions are due to an unsatisfactory Zazen practice. It is most effective to recompose one's body when you find that you are not doing Zazen satisfactorily. It is also traditional to ask to receive the Kyosaku. Now, the Kyosaku is the flat oak stick that we use to correct posture, put up against your back, and also strike your shoulders if you request it. And in our practice, you have to request the stick. A little bit of information on the Kyosaku Sensei, Matsuoka Roshi, felt it was uh, so important that he named his collection of talks the Kyosaku. Again, these are available on the web. These were his talks from the 60s, 70s, and into the 80s. Then we have a second collection called Mokurai, uh, for his later talks. And he died in 1997. So the two chapters in here explaining the Kyosaku, which has fallen into disuse uh, in a lot of Zen centers. I think there's a Western perception or a preconception that it's a form of violence. It looks violent when you hit somebody with a stick. Uh, but it's called Kiyosaku. Uh, one of the meanings is blow of compassion. So the person giving the stick is practicing compassion for the one who's striking the stick. So our mindfulness bell is just to take a moment to stop uh, uh, the trajectory that we're on. And remember that the teachings of Buddhism are all about this present reality, this present moment. So uh, disposition of the, of the uh, body, of disposition of breathing, disposition of the mind. These three uh, simple aspects, Matsuoka Roshi would often say that when the posture, the breath, and the attention all come together in a unified way, this is the real Zazen. So this posits that we could be doing unreal Zazen. Uh, we could be doing imaginary Zazen. We would think we're doing Zazen when we're not. Uh, when the posture, the breath, and the attention all come together in a unified way, this is akin to Master Dogen saying something like, he said it many different ways, as did Matsuoka Roshi, but in stillness, mind and object merge in realization and go beyond enlightenment. So we think enlightenment is the path, enlightenment is the practice. Uh, awakening is this extraordinary or uh, transformative event that happens in your own consciousness, where mind and object merge in realization, in stillness, mind and object merge in realization and go beyond enlightenment. So realization is not something that we can do. Realization is not something we can make happen. But we can certainly begin to recognize stillness uh, when we enter into it in our practice. And we can recognize when it becomes deeper and deeper. Another word for stillness is samadhi. You may have heard this term samadhi, balanced, centered state. So we think our zazen practice has to do with becoming physically balanced, in the posture, upright sitting, uh, from which flows mental balance, uh, less confusion, more clarity, uh, emotional balance, uh, less reactivity to the ups and downs on the roller coaster. Zen doesn't claim magically to get rid of the roller coaster or flatten it out. And finally, social samadhi, where um, in your relationships, in everyday life, at home, at work, and so forth, you can become more balanced because you have become more balanced within yourself. You're okay uh, with or without a relationship, you might say. Uh, so in that relationship, you can be more okay, maybe, and less needy, less uh, compulsive, obsessive, etc., uh, and so on. So uh, perfection in Zen is the last stanza, and perfection in Zen is a little bit of an odd idea 
uh, from Matsuoka Roshi to say because to use because he would often say in Zazen keep aiming at the perfect posture never imagining that you've achieved it so the, uh, his teaching was more open-ended don't attach yourself to perfection don't attach yourself to the idea that something can be perfected just keep aiming at it so it's a very open-ended kind of uh, method or process the paramitas for instance are often translated uh, you know dana which is a charity uh, shila precepts uh, uh, the um, uh, practice of endurance or uh, you know, energy uh, was sometimes called um, uh, jhana means meditation uh, practice of meditation is a perfection and uh, finally um, wisdom prajna uh, prajna is what um, occurs comes out of the perfection of all the others but we don't imagine that there's actually a stage of perfection in any of these we are perfecting generosity not only in our activities but as a state of mind uh, we're perfecting um, the precepts you know do not do not kill do not steal and so forth do not speak ill of others and so we find ourselves failing to do this and we continue perfecting so we want to think of all of the teachings of Zen as dynamic they are more a verb than a noun more a process than a state of achievement uh, or a level of status or something of that kind so the paramitas are like that and perfection in Zen is like that we are continually perfecting our Zen and really Zen is continually perfecting us uh, sometimes people make the mistake of referring to me as a Zen master and, and uh, I, I want to stress the point we don't master Zen Zen masters us so it's a process uh, amongst other ways of describing a process of surrender we surrender to it we let it take over and this is true in our Zazen as well as in our daily life so this this attitude of perfecting means that we're we're okay with non-perfection uh, we allow ourselves to fail Master Dogen said fall down seven times get up eight uh, in creative uh, activities all of us who are in the cre creative fields know that you have to fail in order to succeed right you can't learn if you don't fail so success ahead of me. <laughs> <laughs> you got big time success coming <laughs> good news so um, Zen I think is the heart of creativity uh, uh, just sitting still enough long enough everything changes so we actually become creative about our own consciousness you might say we transcend our own limits of our own consciousness so perfection in Zen let's finish this and then we'll take some time to have I have a few more little quotes I want to read from the Kyosaku when one is able to put into actual practice the disposition of the body the disposition of breathing and the disposition of the mind then one Zen is already in the stage of perfection now let me say that again when one is able to put into actual practice the disposition of the body the disposition of breathing and the disposition of the mind then one Zazen is already in the stage of perfection then he goes on to say here are some of the effects which will appear when one Zazen is in the stage of perfection the body is filled with the feeling of good health and has the elasticity of a rubber ball the mind is clear and refreshed its functions are agile and quick one finds happiness in whatever one does one finds richness of life in everything one attempts one clearly knows one's life's direction and has no hesitancy one is calm brave and happy in thought speech and conduct one is open-hearted unsophisticated and spontaneous one does not hide things from others one is in harmony with the surroundings into which one assimilates oneself one does everything with sincerity and initiative now, as I say in the book if this is beginning to sound a little like the Scouts code of honor to you 
it's, it's for good reason. It's because Matsuoka Roshi had an unwavering faith in uh, the strength of, of Zazen, Zen meditation, and its ability to help us um, sort of reform or um, Uchiyama Roshi used to refine our own life, refining our life. Um, so no matter where we stand on the spectrum, no matter how uh, self-critical we are, we should have uh, enter into Zen practice with some degree of faith, in the sense of faith in the ancestors, not a religious faith, in a belief. But why would these great ancestors, including Matsuoka Roshi, over the past 2,500 years, why would they have bothered to, to do this and teach it, you know, if there weren't, weren't something there? So with that, let me turn to the Kiyosaku, and I want to just key back to the introduction, and let's do it one more time. The thought of Zen is the flower. The mind is attracted by its beauty. The art of Zen is the fruit. Its savor comes home to one's heart. The practice of Zen is the life. By it, the body and mind become strong and continue to prosper for eternity. The place of the practice of Zen is Zazen. The ideal of Zazen is the seated figure of Buddha. We love the flower of Zen. We rejoice in the fruit of Zen. We yearn for the life of Zen. So I want to just key on this one mention of a flower. The thought of Zen is the flower. And give you a couple of instances where Matsuoka Roshi used the metaphor of the flower to explain a teaching. Uh, he says, a inter little introduction to the paragraph about the flower, that to a Buddhist, then, their life is only one part of the universe. And all in this universe is intricately interrelated. Zen Buddhists see life and death in this perspective, understanding that they are not two different things, but only different aspects of the same process. They think of life as fleeting and yet very meaningful. To them, everything, everything in the universe is impermanent and changing. Death and sickness come unexpectedly and yet they come to everything. Because we think of ourselves as a part of such a gigantic thing as the whole of the universe, we are not so prone to be disturbed at the thought of sickness and death coming to us. Neither do we make our illness worse by worrying about it. For this reason, if a Buddhist becomes ill or death approaches them, they face it calmly. They do not feel that there is something special about themselves which should shield them from these inevitabilities of life. At our birth, we are predestined to die, just as it is a leaf or a flower blossom. A Zen Buddhist thinks of their life much like a flower. It begins with a bud at birth and then blossoms out as time passes. And yet, a strong wind, such as a serious illness or accident, may shake loose this blossom from the tree of life. Strong winds come unexpectedly and shake many flowers off from the trees early in their lives. Thus, death may come early. Or the flower may live to autumn and thus to old age. But eventually, even the most beautiful flowers wrinkle up and die. A Zen Buddhist realizes that their life will follow this pattern exactly. And when death comes, they think of it like a falling petal. So I wanted to add a comment to my own about flowers uh, that may not have occurred to you. Is they're, they're unaware of their own beauty. They blossom, and, uh, but they, they have no uh, awareness of their own beauty. So you, you have to ask yourself, where does the beauty lie? Uh, I sometimes explain my art as being existing not in the painting, not in the viewer, not in the artist. Uh, what I see when I look at one of these paintings is different from what you see. And what you see is different from what I see. Uh, neither of those is more accurate than, or more real than the other. So the, the art 
exists somewhere in between the person looking at it, the art itself, and the artist who painted it. It's somewhere in between. And so I think uh, this is one way of thinking about the beauty of the flower. Where does it, where does it actually exist? So um, here's the introduction a little bit to this comment. The other day, I happened to glance at a book called Silent Spring by Rachel Carson in a bookstore. Its title is beautiful and makes me feel the quietness of the awakening earth as winter melts away. I didn't have to read far beyond the opening sentence to know that the author knew nature, as do I. She wrote about a small American town that lay nestled in the country in complete harmony with its surroundings, a peaceful village and a prosperous place to live. But the purpose of the book was to give example after example of the disruption that results when mankind begins to tamper with nature as if we controlled its path. People in this village could no longer live the life of contentment that comes from hard work and a fruitful harvest, for one disruption followed another. Mankind had forgotten that we are not apart from the immense world that surrounds us and that we must live in harmony with it. There's a hike poem that I would like to tell you about today. In Japanese, this poem goes, Asagao ya, tsurube torarete, morai mitsu. In English, it might be translated, Behold the morning glory, the bucket made captive, I beg for water. This hike poem was written by a poetess named Chio, and it tells her feeling as she went to fetch water from the well one early June morning. She reached for the water bucket and found that the sky blue morning glory had wrapped its stem tightly around its wooden frame. Chio stopped in awe of the beautiful, flowers, uh, beautiful colors of the flowers and returned home without the water she needed. The beauty of the flower had left her speechless and she could only say, oh, the morning glory as she looked at it. Her compassion would not let her disturb its growing place, and instead of ripping its stem from the wooden handle, she did without the water. This is a story that we can learn from. It teaches us the eternal beauty that can be found in nature, and that it should not be disturbed. The poetess, Chio, could not rip the morning glory from the bucket because she did not feel she had more right to the water than the morning glory had for the support of the bucket. She did not feel superior to the delicate flower so that she could uproot it. Instead, she sought water elsewhere. So he goes on to say, man must learn that he is part of this vast nature that surrounds us. The gigantic sea shows us our true proportion when we stand upon its shore. And we should also learn that we are not apart from it, just as the sea is not complete without its sandy bottom or shore. We are part of nature just as are its woody forests, flying birds, or swimming fish. One more. So this comes uh, from a talk he gave around Hanamatsuri. Hanamatsuri means Festival of Flowers. It's the celebration of Buddha's birthday, which we do here each year as well. Uh, the golden lotus statues that you see on the on the uh, altar there are spoken of here. Um, the flower first came into uh, play in Buddhism when Buddha is said to have held up a flower, blossom, turned it, and uh, Mahakashapa smiled, one of his disciples, and that was the first transmission. So this story is very significant on this day of the Festival of the Flowers. The golden lotus has long been a symbol used in Buddhism, reminding us of the nature of our lives and what we may become. The lotus flower has its root at the bottom of a muddy pond, and it slowly makes its way up through the cloudy waters to the life-giving sunlight above. 
It is not until its young bud breaks through the water and reaches the sunlight that its beautiful, delicate flower blossoms forth. Having its origin in the dirty mud, the lotus flower becomes one of the most beautiful seen by man when its long stem finally reaches the warmth of the sun. Human life has been compared to this lotus flower. Each individual is born into a mortal life. Feeling the world around them and thinking its invisible forms conform perfectly, or its visible forms, conform perfectly to its ultimate reality. Most people live their lives in this sensual world, suffering the pains of a materialistic life and doing little to brighten their world by enlightening their minds. Without spiritual lives, their world is lived day by day as a routine of work, illness, and increasing age. To some, these are enjoyments, but these too are fleeting. Their lives become heavy with monotonous routine and the misfortunes of life that come everyone's way in a lifetime. This is the mud of human life. <coughs> the Buddha was the living example of the person who can rise above this never-ending cycle of life and death, of suffering. The beautiful lotus flower is the blossom that emerges in the sunlight. The enlightened one is the person who achieves Buddhahood and brings forth the light of humankind, which is what uh, Buddha was called, one of his titles. The golden lotus flower reminds us of the life which we can have. This is the deep meaning of the law, which the Buddha told in silence to the multitude on Vulture Peak. In all, there is the Buddha nature in everything. The Buddha said, all beings are endowed with the truth of the Tathagata. Tathagata is another honorific title. It means the thus come one, one who comes from, returns to suchness, Tatha. All someday can realize the Buddha nature which lies deep within and can become enlightened when the right time comes. That right time can be any time if the mind is empty and freed from selfish thoughts or evil thoughts. The time of such purity is like the birth of the Buddha. It is the spring of life. This is the meaning of the simple Japanese poem. Toshi goto ni sakya yoshino no yama sakura kyo warite myo hana no arika o Translated means, yearly bloom Yoshino Mountain's cherry blossom tree. But, try to cut through and see, where is the flower? This short poem tells us that the flower is there on the branch each year in due time. Every year the beautiful blossoms unfurl their delicate petals as the springtime breezes blow. But, during the winter, if one tries to cut the branch to find their seed, it will not be found. When one's mind is not ready, or when it will cut and dissect and analyze, the flower of the Buddha nature will not appear. But when the spring of life appears and one's heart and mind are pure, a Buddha is born. Meditation empties the mind and purifies the heart. It brings the springtime of life. So one last poem that uh, Sensei referred to, uh, it's not quoted here, but he, he quoted this poem uh, in the same context of another hike, said uh, something like, there by the shrub, the natsna. Natsna are tiny little flowers you can barely see. If you, if you didn't look carefully, you wouldn't even notice them. So that's the hike poem that he said against this one. Um, let me read the people in the West are familiar with the poem by Tennyson uh, saying almost the same thing as Nansen said when he, he uh, tried to impress upon an official that if heaven and earth with all the manifold objects between them issue from the one root which you and I also come from the Buddha nature this root must be firmly seized upon so that there is an actual experience of it. So people in the West are familiar with this poem by Tennyson saying almost the same thing. Tennyson wrote, Little flower, uh, I think in the crannied wall, if I remember correctly, 
It, but if I could understand what you are, root in all, and all in all, I should know what God and man is. Although in Zen there is no God, we can understand Tennyson's poem to say that if this small flower were truly understood, truly grasped, heaven and earth, all of life would be truly comprehended. This is enlightenment. So um, we offer flowers during Hanamatsuri uh, as, a, as a dedication or a, uh, during the Buddha's uh, birthday cer ceremony. But uh, I would like to say just a little bit more about that last poem. Matsuoka Roshi, in talking about that, would say that this is one difference between the Western mindset and the Eastern mindset. Uh, if you look at the flower in the cranny wall and you think, the way I can understand this is to pull it apart, dissect it, analyze it, put it under the microscope, you know, uh, and so forth. That's the then I will know God. I will know. I will know the meaning of this all. And comparison and contrast to the poem. Uh, Look by the hedge, the Natsana. Just leaving, leaving it where it is. There's an old saying I think in Zen. I dedicate all the flowers of the world uh, to all the Buddhas, uh, just as they are. So. I think uh, Matsuoka Roshi's uh, use of the flower symbols in various contexts like that help us begin to understand uh, a metaphorical way of seeing our own life. And uh, we can become unaware of our own beauty. <laughs> Hopefully we're manifest, manifesting some beauty in our lives. But if we're aware of it, it's like they say, you know, oh, she's so beautiful. Yeah, but she knows it. <laughs> right? I was thinking, how could you, could you apply it? Uh, oh, oh, he is so, he's so humble. Yeah, but he knows it. Or he is, she is so, <laughs> yeah, but, but she knows it. <laughs> so anyway, let's open up for our question and answers. Anything that stood out for you? I know that was very long. Uh, anyone? just feel some, uh, such, uh, I think, deep gratitude uh, that the Buddha Dharma came um, through, through, through Matsuoka. Mm. You, we, we were talking one time and you mentioned it really is uh, really almost like a Buddha Dharma coming from the West. Um, and, that, uh, and that it found fertile ground here. And that, and that it found, the Buddha Dharma found fertile ground. And uh, I feel such uh, gratitude to you uh, for, uh, for helping to water it. <clears throat> yeah, we all feel gratitude for this, um, but in a way it's in, inappropriate to sort of um, focus that gratitude on, on, on someone else uh, who's practicing. Uh, because in Zen, uh, you know, abstractly, we question the existence of the self, so we we can't look at our behavior as selfless, purely, you know, any more than we can look at it as selfish. So what we do for Zen um, is somewhere in, in between. Uh, it can't be said to be that we're doing it for ourselves exactly, nor can it be said that we're actually doing it for others as if we're some great saint and self-sacrificing hero. It's um, it's grounded. It's more grounded than that. It's, it's, it works for me. Right? Uh, it could work for others, hopefully. It works for others. Uh, you're coming here today, uh, you know, uh, means that I can be the Zen teacher today. I'm not the Zen teacher at home, <laughs> I can guarantee you. Hmm. Uh, <laughs> so, uh, part of the interconnectedness, interrelatedness that Matsuoka was talking about is that. This works, uh, Sangha community works, by virtue of our being here together, practicing together. This is what brings it to life. On art, with the creativity of the perspective, the, the artist and against the viewer or listener, 
what uh, when you remove, I guess, the, the typical purposes of making the thing, uh, you're not making it necessarily to be viewed or listened to. You're just making it. Is it what comes forth then? Does it match the purpose that you that you set out to do? Mm -hmm. The fact that you've made it does without purpose mm -hmm. in mind. Mm -hmm. uh, is that achieved or um, I don't know? Is that achieved or achievable? Well, certainly. Uh, so I think what we're talking about is kinds of dialogue, maybe, mm -hmm. maybe a monologue dialogue. Mm -hmm. One way of thinking about it. So certainly, when you work with a medium. It's constantly feeding back to you what it will and will not do. You can't bend wood to do what metal does, for instance, mm -hmm. and so forth. If you work with paint the way I do, I'm paying strict attention to what it seems to want to do. <laughs> and I'm trying to help that happen, but uh, definitely uh, paint will not do what I do with it by itself. Right. And so it's a dialogue between myself and the medium. And that's teleologic, that is, it feeds back to me, you know, and I get something from that. I learn, understand something, but when I see, you know, earth, wind, fire, and water all at work, you know, the fundamental elements at work, on a microcosmic kind of scale, you might say. Uh, but then I think when another person looks at it, if they find beauty in it, uh, it's a bit of a surprise, you know, if somebody finds something beautiful that I uh, find beautiful. Uh, the beauty, again, is like the art. It doesn't come simply from what the artist does, although skill, technique, all of that's important. Um, the beauty is somewhere in the uh, interchange between the artist and the medium, and somehow it results in this result, this effect. And then uh, a lot of artists will say this, that's not original with me, but uh, they say they try to get out of the way. They try to let the music happen, they try to let the art happen, they try to let the dance Attachment to come, come out and try to get out of the way because every time uh, something happens to screw it up, they can tell they, they just got in the way. <laughs> so there is a dialogue definitely going on between the, the individual and the medium. But then when you put it in the social context, you say, well, what sense of it is it that this uh, person lived and died in a cave and nobody ever saw their art and, you know, the cave caved in and, you know, uh, a lot of conceptual artists are, are sort of play with that idea. Uh, the uh, Tibetan monks who do the sand mandalas, they just, they're, poured away. Native Americans did the same thing with sand. They'd do mandalas and they would blow away with the wind. So there's an expression or a recognition of impermanence right? in, in art. We all recognize art as impermanent. And so in many ways it's more precious because of its impermanence. Even though you try with might and main and spend a lot of money you know, trying to preserve uh, uh, art in museums and so on. But uh, the inherent impermanence is, is there as part of the ethic or part of the... Does, does that make sense? Yes. So uh, sharing art by putting it in public and letting people see it, again, uh, I don't think is communication in the ordinary sense that we mean, uh, that we usually mean by communication, that I'm, I'm, I'm forming this message to you. Uh, when you work within a, a medium, uh, it kind of takes over uh, to a great extent. And the message that the other person is receiving, certainly you've lost control of that message. But losing control of it is part of the, the joy of it, or the creativity of it, not, not trying to control. So I think the social, it's a little bit like Zen, as I said, social samadhi comes about, you know, through physical and personal samadhi. They're developing personal patience. We have more patience with others. They're developing personal samadhi in Zazen. We enter into relationships with more stability on our end, right? No. Makes sense. So I think art is like that. It's happening between us.
Anyone else? Would you mind reading the haiku again? The last one? Yes, the one that you read. That, uh... Of course, I took the place marker out, so I don't know where it is. Well, I can find it, that's all right. Yeah, I think that might be better. <laughs> 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 it's in here somewhere. Okay, thank you. Get the book. I have it. <laughs>